our world is constantly evolving. As time moves forward, things change, which is why it's important to stay informed. Throughout the year, there are dozens of professionals that share their expertise with the community through lectures sponsored by local government agencies and area not-for-profits. And each month, SLC-TV will feature one of these visiting professors as they discuss the latest current events. So grab a notebook and pull up a chair, because the lecture hall is about to begin. All right, my name's Tricia Spazzato. Um, I'm a native of Florida, as Sue has said, and um, I've got a master's degree in biology with an emphasis on immunology. Uh, I'm a senior scientist at Ecological Associates, which is down in Jensen, about nine minutes away from here. And um, I basically do a lot of survey work for endangered species and do environmental resource permitting. And um, one of my favorite things that I do with my job is actually um, antagonize scrub jays. That's um, a, one of my favorite things to do. And then we supply a report for the um, presence of scrub jays all along the Florida transmission lines in some of these um, FPL projects. So um, without further ado, I'd like to get into bats and bridges because bats are not closely related to sea turtles, um, and uh, which is kind of why I wanted to do it. Um, basically, I roped Richard, not kind of play on words there. I roped Richard into being my partner for uh, Ken Jilly's Upland class, largely because I had no idea about bats too much, and I wanted to do another project, but. Um, you guys know what it's like when you take a class. The instructor comes out and says, hey, we've got all these projects back there, and by the time you get a break and go back there, they're already filled up. Everybody's picked all the really cool ones. And one of them was looking at mammals at night and doing critter cams out on the uh, extension office, and I thought that sounded really cool. But this was the next best thing, because that was all filled up, and like I said, um, talked Richard into joining me with that, and that's kind of how we got onto the Bats and Bridges project. So a little bit of background on bats. Um, there's approximately 1,200 species of bats worldwide, and that c encompasses about 20% of all the mammals on Earth, which is staggering if you think about it. Um, 47 of those species are found on the North American continent, and of those, uh, we were hoping to find a few. We don't have that many in Florida. Um, we have probably less than 10 here in Florida. Despite the fact that they have a rodent-like appearance that you can see here on the fruit bat here at the um, lower left corner here, um, he's, he, he's got a cute little face if my laser pointer wanted to stay. Um, but they're actually more closely related to primates than they are to, to rodents and squirrels. They have a range of sizes from a couple of ounces to three pounds, and without sounding like an ex you know, mother that just delivered, they range uh, to two inches in length, their wingspan, to almost six feet. That's a, quite a disparity. Um, and as you, everyone probably knows, they have a membranous um, wing, and this right here is actually their wrist, if you can see it. Uh, this doesn't want to play nice with me. Um, so this is the carpal here, and that's what you see here, and these are their fingers, okay? Um, they're, the bat species are actually divided into two different groups. The mega bats, which are the larger ones that I just ref made reference to, that three pounds, um, six foot wingspan, and the micro bats. And they thereby make up the order of Choroptera. Okay? Choroptera um, actually stands for bone wing. And these animals are endothermic, and everybody that's taken uh, the Florida Master Naturalist classes has a really good knowledge of what the difference is between ectothermic and endothermic. Um, and as endotherms, one of the things that, because I studied sea turtles for so long, it's kind of a whole different physiology for me. But one of the things that I really found interesting about bats is that they actually live 3.5 times longer than other mammals, non-flying mammals that are their same size. So one of the um, studies that I looked at by Wilkinson and South was actually discussing the um, ideas of why they could actually do this. And part of the reasoning is, is because they actually go through hibernation for 180 days. So they slow their heart rate down, they stay warm, they will cuddle up together to keep that body warmth going, um, and thereby um, decreasing their metabolism so that they can actually survive a longer lifespan. And one of the things that we talk a lot about in physiology is the notion of heartbeats. And while it kind of sounds 
you know, silly, and everyone knows this, your life is measured in heartbeats. So if you have a hummingbird that's this big and it beats heartbeat rates about 1,200 beats per minute, what kind of lifespan would you expect them to have? A very short one. On the other hand, when you have something like a large whale, like the um, right whales or the bowhead whales, they have a heart rate of about eight beats per minute. So you'd expect them to have a very long. And in fact, they live to be about 200 years old. Okay. Um, one of the things I want to point out here is that, like I said, they are closely related to primates and the wings of the bat are actually homologous to our um, arm. And you can see that um, between the sternum here is really kind of short, if you can see that there, and uh, compared to ours, ours comes down to about here. Um, we have a, a larger scapula, but they have so much power in the adaptability of the way their fingers actually um, will lie. And if you can, I like tormenting my audiences, so if you wanted to go like this to do a bat's wing and try to curve down, spread your fingers out as far as you possibly can. How comfortable are you right now? No. Okay. <laughs> so basically with the bats, their thumb is that top part there. It's the shortest little portion of, of their hand and they'll use that to clasp on, hang on, um, actually walk if they need to. Um, it kind of reminds me of Bram Stoker's Dracula when you know he's climbing up the castle wall. It's kind of like that. And their pinkies are really very long. It's the longest portion. So if you could do all this and pull your hands in and, and fly, what that does is it acts like a rudder. And it brings a great m amount of maneuverability to, to the bat when it's flying. Okay. All right. Um, there's a lot of myths about bats that they'll fly into your hair, will suck your blood, um, and other crazy notions, but they're really not all that scary. Um, matter of fact, only 1% of bats do consume blood. That's not a lot. Think about how many mosquitoes have consumed your blood over your lifetime, and bats are far less likely to do so. <laughs> Um, the majority are insectivores, um, approximately 70%. And they're a very important component of upland systems. And one of the things that they're really um, friendly to is the agricultural business. They are known to eat up to about 140 tons of pests that consume um, the fruits and um, the pests that consume our produce, is what I'm trying to say. Um, of the bats, not all of them actually use echolocation. I don't know if anybody knows that or not. Only the ones that are actually chasing those pests. So the insectivores are the ones that are going after um, the insects using echolocation. Now, one of the papers that I just read, it came out on April 10th, so I was pretty excited to find it because I'm a geek, I guess. Um, but they've just been looking at brain activity research at Johns Hopkins University. And what they've done is they've designed a room and they've got it all dark. They've set it up with cameras and um, ultrasound. And they've got a little tiny cap that acts as an encephalogram that is really lightweight. They put it on the heads of the bats. They allow the um, bats to fly around and they're picking up what the actual neural activity is in the brain and what they're focusing on in the room at the same time, based on where the sonar, you know, sonar is going and um, how in the direction of the bat flying. So I'm really excited to see the results on that because if you think about um, how fast these animals move, and they're chasing prey, and they're echolocating, and they have to create this picture in their brain, all their synapses are firing at a very rapid rate. So I moved this around a little bit from the last time you guys saw the um, talk. I wanted to um, say a little bit about bat echolocation here. It's very similar to the way whales and dolphins echolocate with one exception. The sound travels four times faster underwater than it does in the air. So these guys have got to come up with some pretty unique adaptations to kind of figure out what's going on in their environment. And like I said, scientists are just now starting to study it, so it's kind of exciting. Um, 
Basically, the simplest idea is, is that the larynx of the bat will emit a sound, just like I'm emitting sounds right now by speaking with you. It'll bounce off of an object and come back. There's an amplitude of chirp that's sent out. It gets broadcast, depending on the bat species, between 20 and 105 kilohertz. It hones in on the um, object. It bounces back, again, in amplitude. And in that time of amplitude, it comes back to the um, bat's brain and lets it know what it's actually looking at. And of course, the air conditioner is on right now, but hopefully you can hear this. So what you're hearing is a lot of chirping and you're hearing like little pings. And when we get through tonight, I hope you'll join us, we're gonna go outside and actually listen for, for bats. So part of the, um, another paper that I read was actually why do bats have weird noses? And what they found was that some of the species actually have to deal with they're not really focused on their sonar. So these weird noses actually help the sound that comes back and it, they increase their surface area here in the shape of this is a, a, a nose leaf or leaf nosed bat and then this one is called a horseshoe bat. And you can see that they're different but they take in the sonar in a, in a different way. So whatever picture bounces back actually goes through their nose and, and, and kind of narrowly defines where that object is at. And they're so cute, right? All right, I want to go into a little bit about life history, um, especially since the whole idea of this project was based on bridges. Um, they have a lot of different shelter options available depending on where they're at and which state. Um, now, they, are, they roost in colonies ranging from small, less than you know, 25 bats, to a medium size ranging about 100 bats up to millions of bats not here in Florida, but in places like Texas, Carlsbad Caverns, that sort of things. Um, one of the papers that I read was by the Florida Department of Transportation. They did a study from 2003 to 2006, and they actually tested in Florida all these ty different types of bridges. And they looked at the different types of concrete, steel, and pre-stressed concrete, and they actually found that the bats that are found in Florida prefer a pre-stressed concrete bridge. Does that mean anything to anybody? Well, it doesn't, but it kind of does. Where do, where do bats like to hide, Richard? In the dark. In the dark of the what joint? Expansion. Of the expansion joint. So um, basically, those pre-stressed concrete bridges have a little bit of maneuverability so that when you know, the big trucks are going over or what have you. And apparently, it doesn't bother them when they're roosting inside those expansion joints. There are approximately 300 bridges in Florida that are pre-stressed concrete that we can find bats in. Only four in St. Lucie County. <laughs> they emerge from the roost at dusk to forage, um, and they'll come back in, in the, at dawn, and basically they can travel you know, up to 50 to 60 miles to, in search of food. Um, and like I said, they're very strong um, flyers, in fact, um, one of the most recent papers that I read on flight speeds nails them at 100, over 100 miles an hour. And they had a very novel approach in finding this. They, they followed one bat per night for eight nights. They hired a pilot to follow one bat per night for eight nights. And he, they said that they had some really hard time keeping up with the bat in a plane because the plane has wings like this and the bat doesn't, right? So they found out that um, some of the female bats, um, the Brazilian free-tailed bats, which is what we're gonna talk about a little bit more in depth, fly at speeds over 100 miles an hour, faster than any bird, <laughs> and that includes the kestrel. They have a lifespan of approximately eight to 10 years in the wild, although they do have about five species that are known to live over 30 years. Females give birth to one pup, and that pup will gestate for anywhere from 11 to 12 months. So it's kind of energetically expensive 
for the female to go through gestation. Pups are born without fur and they cannot fly for up to seven weeks approximately. Um, the pups are actually strategically placed, generally if it's possible, in a separate area of the bridge or whatever um, attic or wherever the their house bats find their home, and it's called a crèche. So within four to seven weeks, the young bats actually can go out and locate their own food. And I did just read, because I was wondering about this too, they're mammals and they actually do drink milk for the first um, four to seven weeks of their life. Milk to insects, I'm not sure, but that's kind of how it goes. All right, so getting into why we looked at bats in the first place, we asked Ken, what do you, we'd like to work with bats, what do you suggest? And Ken was throwing out all kinds of ideas. And he took us to this bridge. And you can see that they're staining on the, on the bridge, on the crossbar there. It, it looks kind of kind of dirty, but that's actually a little bit of guano and algae mixed in. It smells pretty pungent <laughs> when you walk up there. So you know there's bats. Um, he brought his little ultrasound um, Peterson echo locator and we used that and we could hear the bats. Okay, so we know we got bats. Okay, so we did the three things right off the bat for our materials and methods was we got a bridge, we got staining, we had odor, and we had an auditory presence. So when we were designing the, the experiment, um, you know, Ken rattled off a whole bunch of different things. You gotta look for this, this, and this, and you should, I want you to figure out what the bats are eating. And we're like, great, we'll figure out what the bats are eating. So how do we do that? We don't have insect traps. And he's like, oh, just go to Publix and get this litany of things, right? I'm, so I'm in the plastic aisle at Publix and I'm looking for saran wrap and, and latex gloves and freezer bags and string and paper plates and Vaseline in another aisle and I felt like kind of the MacGyver school of hunting for insects. Uh, we brought a camera and we used Google Earth and we put all this together to string up insect traps. Okay, That's what those white paper <laughs> plates are. They have Vaseline on both sides and we're, we left them overnight so that, to see if we caught any bugs. The next thing we used was the ultrasound um, detector, and this was provided by Ken, and it's a pretty expensive piece of equipment. He only lets Richard use it, and that's why Richard's here tonight. Um, one of the things that he wanted us to do as well was to analyze guano. But don't touch the guano, he says, because rats have rabies, or excuse me, uh, bats have rabies, so you don't want to, you know, don't touch anything. Just please be careful. Yes, Ken, we got latex glove, we got freezer, you know, we didn't breathe anything in, we're good. So we basically um, take the guano samples and we send them over to the IFAS laboratory for analysis. Uh, we also take all of our paper plates over to IFAS for analysis. And then we, decided that, well, actually, I shouldn't say we. Richard kind of looked at me, and he, he's out there like with this thing, and he goes, what's the point? And I looked at him, and he goes, I said, what do you mean, what's the point? He goes, well, why are we doing this? And I'm like, to find bats, you know? And so he looks at me again, and he's like, okay, well, then we need to come up with something a little different to find bats. And I'm like, okay, good point. So what we did was we split St. Lucie County in half, um, did a Google Earth image of all the different bridges that we could find in St. Lucie County, and this is also in the PowerPoint, um, and we s went and looked for bats. Sometimes we could get in the same, you know, vicinity at the same time with that ultrasound. Sometimes, you know, I took my significant other and we cruised all over looking at bridges, which he probably thought was really crazy. Um, we basically set the ultrasound to um, 20 to 25 kilohertz because that was what uh, we were told that St. Lucie County bats would kind of echolocate and that would be the range that we could hear them. Now I say St. Lucie County bats, but there's only one species of bat in St. Lucie County and it's the Brazilian um, free-tailed bat. And because uh, some people are really into taxonomic names, I put that up there because I love the name of this. It's cut like Tada, Tadarita Brasiliensis. 
It's a very widely distributed bat all across uh, North America. In fact, it's one of the most abundant, but it is on the decline. It's very easily perturbed. Again, kind of making it a little bit more human, I guess. It's a species of special concern. And this bat isn't as small as that one that I was telling you about uh, with a two inch uh, wingspan. This one has an 11 inch wingspan and it's a medium sized insectivore that ranges about 3.1 to 3.9 inches in body length. And as you can see, I like the upper uh, picture the best. It's got a velvet brown to black coloration. We didn't see them this close, by the way, just, just so you know. All right, so getting into the results section, um, I got an email one day and it said the University of Florida looked all official and I'm reading it and I'm like, okay. And then I got another email that says, if you'd like to know what this says, <laughs> please contact um, so-and-so. But thankfully I have a little bit of a, I'm not great at chemistry, but I could kind of look through here and go, oh, all right, it's not that bad. Um, basically, it has the equivalent of 120 pounds per ton of raw nitrogen in it. Um, the guano also has 114 pounds per ton of uh, just uh, regular nitrogen in it. Phosphorus, 62 pounds per ton, and then a potassium equivalent to uh, 15 pounds per ton. So Ken wanted us to look at the guano analysis to kind of figure out, is it a suitable fertilizer? So based on the analysis, we can say, yes, it's a suitable fertilizer. Um, it's probably a low-grade fertilizer, but the sample tested is, was uh, a good size. Size does matter for actually getting this, the sample size. Um, but we had to, like I said, be very careful because of rabies and, and Ken worried about our, our health. The next part of the results was that we had Dr. Kakar actually analyze the insect traps. Now, I don't know what was going on in between January and February, but I'm pretty sure that every time Richard and I actually scheduled to go out in the field, a cold front came through. So we collected um, lots of wind-blown sand granules on our petroleum-based uh, MacGyver plates. Uh, so we decided that our results were indeterminate. We don't really know what St. Lucie County bats are actually eating because we didn't catch anything. But we can still kind of speculate based on other Brazilian uh, free-tailed bats <coughs> that they probably eat moths, dragonflies, beetles, and flies. They're not mosquito eaters. Like a lot of people seem to think that bats can actually um, keep the mosquito populations down, which would be great for reducing malaria and dengue fever and all that sort of thing. Um, but basically, we do know that the bat is ecologically important in the Florida landscape as it does uh, feed on astonishing numbers of insects. In Texas, they've done some studies where they find that um, annually, the Brazilian free-tailed bat is responsible for eating anywhere from 6,000 to 18,000 metric tons of insects. And most of those are ones that will afflict um, the agricultural business in Texas. Um, one of the things I like to make a joke about is that they have the similar dining habits of humans. How many of you will rush home or on your way home you'll stop and say Wendy's because it's better than McDonald's? Anybody do that? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. You don't have to agree, but do you ever stop at fast food or get something and, and how many of you have eaten it on the way home? Okay. So basically, Bats are like humans, they eat on the fly. So as they're traveling, they're actually consuming their prey. They're not taking it back to a roosting site or anything like that. The only ones that are taking food back are the females to, to the pups. But one of the things that we'd like to see is that if anybody hasn't had the Florida Master Naturalist Uplands section and you decide to take it, um, this would be a good project for you uh, to, to work on. And we actually do have a blog as well so you could contribute your research findings. All right, now the last part that we did while we were out in the field was actually film the bats. Richard had um, his film and I had my camera out as well. We are using Richard's film uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one was is that I was completely amazed and shocked at how fast they fly and I may have said some bad words. Uh, <laughs> now, if you can see right there, um, that's a bat. So we're going to start this. This is about a minute long, and um, 
This is on Angle Road, I-95 and, and the term, where the Turnpike and I-95 are. Uh, there's two bridges there, and this is where we were filming. And hopefully you can hear everything. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Okay. There was no way to actually keep your camera on an individual bat. They're, they're really moving so fast. And um, they're going in and out of these expansion joints between the two bridges, and they're also flying off. So I was asking him what time it was because we were trying to figure out you know, when to start filming for any other bridges that we could possibly find. But this was the only one where we actually took film, uh, film from. Okay, so you get the general idea, right? Okay, so Richard came up with um, kind of a, an answer to his own question, why, you know, why are we doing this kind of thing? So he came up with something um, that I thought was gonna be unique for helping people to look at St. Lucie County uh, bats. Ken really liked the idea, and so we're kind of working on this quick response uh, technology or QR technology, where if people are so in interested, they could kind of have um, a QR code, go to the blog, go look for bats, look at different um, points of information that we still need to create uh, for the, the, um, the blog and create a bat app, if you will. So on our bat app, what we'd like to do is actually put some facts about St. Lucie County Brazilian free-tailed bats. Um, and by the way, Ken has done, he, his talk, he does a talk on bats as well, but it's a little bit of a, a different um, approach to looking at them. He talks a little bit more about rabies and he talks um, about building roosts and that sort of thing. This is something that, I, that Richard and I were thinking, like it would be great if you're kayaking somewhere and you want to know if the bridge you're under has you know, bats in it. Because sometimes you don't see the staining. Maybe you can hear them. And females, women, we tend to hear it a little bit easier than the males do. So um, there's a wildlife acoustics app called the Echometer Touch Bat Detector. And I bought one. So we'll, I'm going to show you guys how to use that tonight. Um, so if you're out there kayaking or doing anything like that, and you, I mean, we all bring our phones, right? You just have a little download um, app on your phone, and you can listen for bats using just this little tiny um, bat detector. And then you can contribute any of your discoveries to our blog, and the blog um, is right there. If you just put in St. Lucie County bats, it'll come up as well. And what we'd like to do is uh, try to get kind of a, a county-wide idea of where the bats really are because they probably aren't just in bridges. You might hear neighbors have them in their house or uh, maybe someone, um, in fact, I think one of the bridges that we did go look at had um, a, a bat house that wasn't too far away from the bridge. So that's kind of the idea of the QR technology in the bat app. Okay. so. Um, Basically, one of the other things that we'd like to do is I created this map on Google Earth, but you need to have Google Earth downloaded to actually be able to zoom in and out to see what bridges the bats are under. Because this is not, I mean, it's a great little map if I was making, writing a report, but for you to go find all these bridges would be next to impossible. So um, one of the things that I'd like to do is actually create a legend where it tells you the intersections of the bridge and what station number, but also put um, a K what we call a KMZ file, which allows you to actually zoom in and out and actually give you, you can actually do a street view as well on Google Earth. So you can see the area around it and figure out if you want to go kayaking or if it's a hike, uh, however you wanted to go do it. All right, there's um, several, there's actually threats to all, um, all bats, but in particular for the Brazilian free-tailed bats, um, loss of habitat in Florida, I mean, pretty much every, almost everybody's from somewhere else anymore, and we're still developing a lot of upland habitats, what's left. 
Um, and then we don't really provide, um, everybody wants a water view. I think bats want a water view as well. They like to have um, water near their roost colony. So that gets developed and then the bats have no home. Um, some areas in, this, in the country have destruction of their colonies. In Florida, we do have some caves, believe it or not. They're mostly up in North Florida, but people vandalize them. You know, kids will go up there and, and vandalize them. And so if you ever see a cave with a chain link fence around, it's probably saving a bat colony. And organopesticides um, are actually a problem for the bats as well. But there are ways that you can help. And in particular, protecting their roost sites is kind of a big thing. In fact, that paper for the Florida Department of Transportation um, that's probably about 12 years old now, they're actually building some of their bridges to be accommodating to bats, which I think is kind of interesting. And then if it's not the right structure, then they'll actually go out and build some of the, the houses that are nearby as well. Public education is a, a big help, not just to Brazilian free-tailed bats, but to every species. Um, and I'm gonna digress here for a second. Something came across uh, my desk on Tuesday, and that was from the US Fish and Wildlife Service regarding pipes and birds. And I'm not sure, it's not a problem here in Florida, but it is out in the Southwest. Um, people will put PVC pipes out in their yards for different reasons. And the birds will actually go in there to build a nest or you know, to hide out, because some of them have like a little hole this big, some of them have a hole that big. But because of the material and the pipe being vertical, they can't get out. Um, so they die a very slow and agonizing death and you know, and that not just not just one bird that gets in there, there'll, there'll be other birds in there as well. So what the Fish and Wildlife Service is actually asking people to do is to cap off their, their pipes. So public education is a very powerful tool because you can go out and, you know, have champion a cause, whatever, you know, drives your passion, that you can go out there and be a good steward. And it's very important as, you know, citizen scientists to go out there and spread the word. Um, the other thing that we could do is you could try to build a bat house if you have a little bit of water uh, near you, uh, in your yard. Um, I'm sure most of us don't want them in our houses, but uh, they do have, you could make like uh, enough room for a medium sized colony with a bat house by yay wide and about that thick and with all the different slats in there um, that they have. And there's all kinds of different designs that you can download uh, from the internet if you wanted to, if you were so inclined to build one. Okay, um, I'm gonna wrap this up because it's getting dusk and I'd like to go out and find some, see if we hear any bats. Um, the Brazilian free tail bat is an important part of the Florida landscape, as I said. Um, guano is a, a suitable fertilizer, but you'll never get it in any great uh, amounts ever. The, um, and we also need more data on their available prey items um, as needed. And this is actually a Brazilian free tail bat, by the way. That's the closest picture I could get of one. I'd like to invite you all to discover St. Lucie bats for yourselves. I think uh, if you know a little bit about this one particular bat and you learn a lot a bit about other particular bats uh, just by proxy, you might be able to steer other people into not being afraid of them and not worrying about them sucking their blood or, or something else. Um, provide the habitat for roosting and foraging if you can and please, please, please don't use pesticides, not for any reason, um, ju not just for bats, but for birds and bees and butterflies and, and all the little things that uh, you know, are nectar eaters and, and uh, those types of invertebrates. Um, there's a group called Bat Conservation International and I'm not by any stretch advocating that you donate. Um, it was just the picture I could find that said support <laughs> bats. Um, one of the things that they're concerned with is an epidemic called white nose syndrome, and this is a fungal infection that bats get. And um, basically, it's been spreading over the last few years. It's now in 33 different states. It hasn't hit Florida. Um, they, they have found in the Brazilian free-tailed bat that the fungus uh, you know, is part of the environment, but the Brazilian free-tailed bats aren't showing any symptoms of white nose syndrome. But, there's all kinds of articles on this particular website. There's um, all kinds of you know, different uh, places where you can go look for bats and um, research and things like that. 
In fact, um, one of the articles that I did read was uh, from April 2015, where they basically came up with the uh, North American Treaty for bats. So um, I, I know you guys are going to be sitting here shocked and amazed, but politicians from Mexico, Canada, and the United States all agreed that we could all do our part to conserve bats together. So I called it Bats Without Borders, or Boundaries, OK? So, so yeah. <laughs> so, um, and if anybody's interested, uh, there are several great scientific research papers out there. Um, and these were a couple of the ones I told you about tonight. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, McCracken paper. It's, uh, he, has a, he has a good Scottish name. And uh, he actually does his research out of the University of Tennessee. And if anybody's interested, I brought the paper. Um, it's, it's really amazing what they're doing with some of the technology right now with chasing down a bat and figuring out how fast it flies. Okay. So, all right, well, there are a couple people I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hikar for actually analyzing my sand samples. Um, Lori and Kyle I work with and they helped me create the, the bat logo for the, the bat maps because we actually, that, there is a bat man logo on there. Um, and of course, Ken, um, by just pointing us in the general direction of, of everything. So, all right. I spoke for 39 minutes. I hope you're not bored out of your minds. <laughs>